Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the ISA webinars organized by the International Service for the Acquisition of Agri Biotech Applications, or ISA. We are live via Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube with currently 437 participants and counting. I am uh, Dr. Rodora Romero Aldenida, Director of the ISA Southeast Asia Center and Director of the Global Knowledge Center on Crop Biotechnology, your host and moderator for this webinar, hosted by the ISA Southeast Asia Center. Again, I'd like to tell you what ISA is. It's a nonprofit charitable organization that has a new mission to promote knowledge sharing on agricultural biosciences, enhancing trust and transparency in the food system, allowing safe and effective innovations to contribute to a sustainable future. ISA is committed to ensure that modern biotechnology and new breeding innovations are communicated and adopted in a transparent manner where trust and transparency are the key elements for the benefits of the stakeholders. Today's webinar is the fourth of the ISA webinars, and we will have a break on the topic of genome editing for now and feature an exciting study on biotech GM crops conducted annually by our resource speaker, Graham Brooks of Fiji Economics Incorporated UK. Wave your hand, Graham. We also have Dr. Mahalakshmi Arijana, our global coordinator in Malaysia, based in Malaysia. And we have Dr. Margaret Karembu from ISA Afri Center. We had Godfrey from ISA Afri Center, EJ from ISA Southeast Asia Center, and Christine from ISA Southeast Asia Center. So our webinar will run for one and a half hours and we will have three poll questions distributed within the course of the webinar. Our audience can send their questions or comments via the Q&A button, which will be answered during the Q&A portion. So I'd like to welcome, now we are 558 participants coming from different parts of the world. So before we start with uh, Graham Brooks, I'd like to give a short background on the global status of commercialized biotech GM crops for 2018, just to segue, to give a segue on what we are going to listen to uh, Dr. Uh, to Graham Brooks. So ISA has been publishing the ISA briefs and since 1996, which has become the most authoritative database on the global area of planted biotech GM crops, its adoption, 
and future prospects. So let me now share with you some nine slides of, uh, where is that there? Okay, can you see it? Okay, so currently we have this uh, biotech, the global status of commercialized biotech crops in 2018. And this is the data which have been accumulated from 1996 to 2018. So biotech crops have been grown. And you can see there that from 1996 to 2018, the area of biotech crops have been increasing. And currently we are now 191.7 million hectares. And the area which is devoted to uh, biotech crops in developing countries has been increasing very gradually in the beginning, but currently it has now gone up to 103.1 million hectares. And it has surpassed the industrialized countries of 88.6 million hectares. So this is just a big opportunity for the biotech crops in many parts of developing countries or in many parts of the world, especially the developing countries to plant biotech crops. So the next one would be our uh, biotech crops planted by trade. And you can see there that the herbicide tolerant crops are the ones increasing very fast. And this composed mainly by biotech soybean or herbicide tolerant soybean with 87.5 million hectares, followed by the stock traits at 80.5 million hectares. And then um, the insect resistant tolerant crops, which has been gradually increasing and currently it has this number. So you can see there that the fluctuations, so it, it has gone up and then has gone down, but you see the stack traits which contain the insect resistance and herbicide tolerance has been gradually increasing and is now almost meeting with the herbicide tolerant crops. This shows that our farmers are getting more smart because they learned that the stack traits contain two uh, herbicide uh, two traits, the herbicide tolerance and insect resistant traits, which would allow them to save on money for the use of chemical sprays and in the control of pests. Now let's move on to the biotech crops by crop. So you see here that uh, biotech soybean has the most number of, uh, the area has the largest area. Um, followed by maize and then uh, cotton and canola. And you can see there that in the beginning, uh, the, the cotton has gone up very slowly, but in 2018, there was this 13% increase from 2017 because uh, cotton demand has gone up in that year. And so let's move on to the global adoption. How does this measure with the global crops. So for example, in soybean, this is 123.5 million hectares planted all over the world. And 78% of that is already GM. And then we have, uh, let me, oh, sorry. Uh, okay. The next one is 76% uh, cotton, uh, which is, uh, there and then we have maize 30 percent with uh, of the 197.2 million hectares and 29 percent canola of the 34.7 million hectares this shows us that we have still to plant a lot more maize globally so these are now this slide contains a lot of information and you can see there that uh, the 26 countries are comprised of 10 Latin American countries, nine Asia in Asia Pacific, two in North America, two in the EU, and three African countries. And you can see there that 46% uh, of the global area is uh, already here in North America with the US and Canada. 
followed by Latin America at 42%, 10% in Asia and the Pacific with our new country, Indonesia, which planted drought tolerant sugar cane in 2018. Then we have in Africa, uh, three countries, which are South Africa, Burkina Faso, and the new country, uh, the kingdom of Eswatini or Swaziland. And then in Europe, we have two countries, Spain and Portugal. So in the 26 countries that planted by the crops, 18 of them planted more than 50,000 hectares. So we have here the Philippines, which has planted 620 thousand hectares by around 400,000 farmers. So compared to 2017, we have an increase of 1.1%. So look, you can see here the plateauing of the area planted to by the crops all over the world. And then um, the top five countries, as I have mentioned, starts with the US with 75 million hectares, followed by Brazil, Argentina, Canada, and India. And you can see that 100% adoption has already been reached by Argentina. And then you can see that most of the other countries are, are following behind with India at 95% of by the uh, cotton. So the plateauing of the area planted by the crops can be seen in these five countries because of saturation. And uh, three of these five countries are developing countries. Okay. And uh, these five countries has planted 91.3% of by the crops in 2018. So ISA has this uh, GM approval database that records the number of approved events all over the world for food, feed, processing, and cultivation. And currently, we have 70 countries that issued about 4,349 regulatory approvals since 1992. So this has increased since this data is, 19, is 2018. So these are the numbers for food use, feed use, and cultivation. And we have 544 approvals in the US, which has the most number of approvals, followed by maize, and then uh, herbicide tolerant maize event or NK603, which is herb, yeah, herbicide tolerant maize. So let's move forward to the uh, current, uh, the contribution of bio crops to food security, sustainability, and climate change. And these are the data provided by Brooks and Barfoot in 2017 where uh, this time we're going to listen to the, the data from 1996 to 2018. So with that, uh, I, I finished my short briefing on biotech crops planted globally. So may I now ask for webinar call one, please? Okay, so the webinar poll one is here in your um, monitor. What is the most important impact of crop biotechnology that resonates with you? Increases farmers' income, decreases pesticide spray, contributes to food security, reduces environmental footprint, all of the above or none of the above. Please choose what is the most important. Okay. Have you all answered? Thank you so much. So for now, we're going to start, but first, let me introduce our guest resource speaker. Graham Brooks is an agricultural economist and consultant with more than 30 years of experience 
of examining economic issues relating to agricultural and food sectors. sectors. He is a specialist in analyzing the impact of the technology, policy changes, and regu regulatory impact. He has, since the late 1990s, undertaken a number of a number of research projects relating to the impact of agricultural biotechnology and written widely on this subject in peer-reviewed journals. This work includes frequent updates of a global economic and environmental impact of GM crops report, the impact of insect resistant maize in Spain and herbicide tolerant soybeans in Romania, the impact of GMO labeling and GMO avoidance in Europe, the economic impact of GMO zero tolerance legislation in the EU, the cost to the UK economy of failure to embrace agricultural biotechnology, the economic impact of biosafety regulation in Turkey, and studies of the potential impact of using biotechnology in Ukraine, Russia, Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Let us welcome Graham to the webinar. We Thank you, Iwila. Uh, let me just get the uh, materials. I need to share the screen first, do I? Right, is that coming up? Yes. Yes, it is. Thank you. Right, are we on full screen now to everyone? Yes. Righto. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, Ola, and thank you very much to everyone at ISA for inviting me today to present the latest update information on our report on the global impact of biotech crops from 1996 to 2018. We've been doing this analysis now since 2004 and what I'm about to present to you is in effect the 14th annual review of GM crop impacts and over that time now I am either a sole or a co-author of more than 30 papers on the impact of this technology in peer-reviewed journals. Now the information I'm presenting to you um, is available or will be available in two peer review papers in the journal GM Crops and Food. The, uh, you can see the, the link here to the journal where these papers will be. If you go onto that link today, you will not find them. The journal tell me that the next edition of the journal in which these two papers will be available on open access is due to be posted sometime in the next five to 10 days. But if you want the information before then, go to our website where the full 200 page report is available or will be available at the end of this webinar. The analysis I'm presenting adds the years 2017 and 2018 to previous analysis. It covers essentially farm level impacts on income, yield, production, and the environmental impact from two perspectives, impact on pesticide usage um, and associated environmental impacts and impacts associated with greenhouse gas emissions. How do we do the work? Well, there is now, not surprisingly, after about 25 years of using the technology, a considerable body of impact literature. A lot of this is in peer review journals, and we draw on this base for most of our analysis. Um, we supplement that with some of our own analysis where some of the traits in use in some countries, there, are, there aren't peer review papers. Uh, so we do our own analysis as well. We try to make it as up to date and accurate as possible by using current values on costs, 
uh, yields, prices. Uh, in terms of environmental impacts, we review pesticide usage information where it's available, make comparisons with conventional alternatives or what would reasonably be used on conventional alternatives if farmers switch back to them. We also draw on the indicator, the environmental impact quotient, which was developed at Cornell University in the 1990s. Um, if you just look at environmental impact change in terms of the amount of pesticide use, it's, it's a, a very poor indicator. The EIQ indicator is, in our view, a better indicator, but it's still nevertheless far from perfect. It is an imperfect measure. Um, but in, in our view, it has some advantages over just looking at the amount of pesticide usage change in terms of the volume of active ingredient used. And lastly, we, we review literature on carbon impacts. This slide essentially gives you the summary of the report's findings. I present it up front so as you get the key information and then we'll look at it in more details. So over that period to 2018, the technology has been responsible for reducing the use of pesticides on the crop area of biotech by 776 million kilograms of active ingredient. That's an 8.6% reduction. But interestingly, in terms of the EIQ indicator, it's a larger 19% cut in the associated environmental impact. For the farmers who have used the technology, they have increased their incomes by a total of 225 billion US dollars. Through the additional yields and extra production, the world has had an extra 824 million tonnes of additional food, feed and fibre from the, the main crops that the technology has been used in. And then lastly, in terms of carbon emissions, in 2018, the latest year, the technology has been responsible for a cut of 23 billion kilograms less CO2 released into the atmosphere, which is equal to taking 15.3 million cars off the road for a year. In 2018, the farm income benefit was equal to $19 billion of extra farm income. To give you some context, in the four main crops where the technology is used of corn, canola, cotton and soybeans, that's the equivalent of adding 5.8% to the value global production of those four crops. Over the 23-year the, um, period, that 20, 225 billion dollars worth of extra income is equal to an average gain per hectare of $97 per hectare. And interestingly, if you <coughs> look at the spread of the income share, slightly more than 50% of it has gone to farmers in developing countries and slightly less than 50% farmers in developed countries. This slide gives you an indication of the breakdown of the average returns per hectare by the main countries where the technology has been used. The key message to take from this is that the highest returns per hectare have tended to be in farms, farmers in developing countries. In terms of the share of the total benefits received by country, farmers in different countries, the largest share has gone to farmers in the United States. Now that's not surprising given that US farmers were some of the first to widely adopt the technology in the mid 1990s and for effectively the last 15 to 20 years the adoption levels in those four crops in the United States have been over 90% of 
all of those crops are using biotechnology. Uh, you will also see the um, importance of farm income gains in countries in South America like Argentina and Brazil and uh, from India and China associated with biotech cotton as other important um, beneficiaries of using the technology. I wanted to also put this slide up in terms of benefits that farmers have um, received from using the technology, which are um, more intangible and not necessarily as easily quantifiable in dollar terms. Um, I don't intend to go through them all, but this is, these are just illustrating some of the benefits. The herbicide tolerant technology um, has essentially helped farmers, giving them better management and flexibility and convenience in how they manage the farms and helped many go into and adopt no-till farming practices, but I'll talk about that later. The insect resistant crops, one of the main benefits that farmers always cite is related to how it's reduced their risk associated with production. They, they essentially need to worry less about uh, the risk of pests damaging and eating their crops. Um, it's also in a crop like maize improved the crop quality with less damage to the grain of the maize crops you get less buildup of um, fumonazine um, infections and ultimately lower levels of cancer-causing mycotoxins. And also in a crop like cotton specifically, which traditionally has been subject to uh, numerous treatments of insecticide to control the many pests, sometimes up to 15 to 20 times per crop, it has significantly reduced the frequency of the need to use insecticides, which in many developing countries where insecticides are applied by hand, often by farmers using little or no protection, it's reduced their exposure to insecticides and therefore improved their health of both farmers and farm workers. In the United States, some of these benefits, um, some academics have in the past tried to quantify these. And if you related to these into the United States and the adoption levels, we've taken those estimates and they would broadly be estimated to equal, be equal to the equivalent of an extra $17 billion worth of farm benefits. If I then move on to this slide, which talks about the net farm benefits relative to the extra cost that farmers pay for the technology. This slide more than any others in my presentation probably illustrates most graphically why far most farmers who've used this technology keep on using it and like using it. In 2018, essentially, the technology cost the equivalent of 27% of the total cake or the benefit of the technology. So you can see in um, this example here that the farm income gain is 18.9 billion, cost of the technology was 6.9. So out of that, um, in, in terms of farmer's return, you can basically say for every extra dollar they've spent on seed, they've got an extra 3.75 US dollars in extra farm income, which is a very good return on their investment. And if you look at the second example, where it's, we pulled out the information in relation to developing countries only, developing country farmers have done even better in terms of for every extra dollar, their farmers have invested in biotech seed, they've got an extra $4.42 in extra income. So you can clearly see why the vast majority of farmers who adopt this technology 
repeatedly go back to using it because they see excellent returns on their investment. In terms of um, the yield versus the cost saving, 72% of the farm income gains have come from yield gains and 28% from cost savings. The yield gains have mostly come from the insect resistant technology and the cost savings mostly from the herbicide tolerant technology. And as I've said earlier, the yield gains have been greatest in developing countries and the cost savings have been mostly in developed countries. This slide gives you um, an indication of the yield gains associated with insect resistance corn in the different countries over the period. The average yield gain 16.5% and as you can see as I mentioned earlier the highest yield gains tended to be in developing countries like the Philippines, Colombia, Honduras. Similar slide for cotton Average yield gain across all countries, 13.7%. The highest yield gains quite, of, quite often found in developing countries like India and Colombia. And then lastly, insect resistant soybeans, which have been uh, available to farmers in South America since 2013. The average yield gain to farmers in the, those four countries has been nine and a half percent. Most the the the, the, um, major, the largest adopting country um, of insect resistant soybeans being Brazil. The herbicide tolerant traits themselves have also contributed um, yield gains and extra production in some cases. Uh, through better weed control and this slide just gives you an illustration of where there have been some yield gains associated with the um, herbicide tolerant technology. Um, I also draw your attention to how the technology has helped farmers adopt no-till production practices in South America which is effectively shortened the complete growing season of soybeans from the time you prepare soil to ultimately harvesting the crop, which has enabled many farmers in South America to grow what's called second crop soybeans after wheat uh, in the same season. Uh, before this technology was available, approximately 5% of soybeans in a country like Argentina would have been second crop and since the widespread adoption of no-till farming facilitated by herbicide tolerant technology the second cropping has gone up from anywhere between about 15 and 30 percent in um, many years. It, it's typically tied to the underlying area of wheat, so it does fluctuate on a yearly basis. If you then pull in all of that uh, information on extra yield, you can see how that equates at an aggregated level in terms of extra production of these crops at a global level. So over the 1996 to 2018 period, uh, the technology has been responsible for producing an extra 277.6 million tonnes of soybeans globally and nearly 500 million tonnes worth of extra maize, nearly 33 million tonnes of extra cotton lint and 14 million tonnes extra of canola. If you then turned that extra production round and said, if you wanted to produce that extra production using conventional agriculture, how much extra land would that require? So this slide gives you the figures of related to the extra production associated with biotech in 2018 and the equivalent extra area of conventional agriculture that would have, would have had to have been devoted to 
production to produce that level of extra production. And in total, it comes to just over 24 million hectares of land, which to give you context is roughly equal to 38% of the cropping area of Brazil. So it's quite a substantial area. Moving on to pesticide use. As I said in an earlier slide, um, the technology has been responsible for reduction in pesticide use of 776 million kilograms of active ingredient use. To give you some context, that's equivalent to 1.6 times the annual amount of pesticide active ingredient use on crops in China. And the associated environmental impact is a larger 19% reduction. The largest gains, not surprising, have been, been associated with the adoption of insect resistant cotton, where you've seen a 331 million kilogram reduction in insecticide active ingredient use, nearly a third. Moving on to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, these derive from two main sources associated with the technology. Uh, the first one of these is reduced fuel use, uh, where insecticides and herbicides are applied by um, sprayers, um, and you're using less of them, there's less fuel use, and um, less soil cultivation, where the herbicide tolerant technology has facilitated the no-till farming systems. In addition, the adoption of no-till has resulted in less soil preparation or ploughing of the land. Now in arable crop production, ploughing of the land is the biggest way in which that type of farming releases carbon into the atmosphere from decay decaying um, root and plant materials. So if you no longer plough, you no longer uh, are releasing the carbon residues from the soil. So you're getting additional soil carbon storage. In 2018, you can see that the reduced fuel use element contributed 2.4 billion kilograms less CO2 released into the atmosphere. Um, and the no-till retention of CO2 not released into the atmosphere has been a larger 20.6 billion kilograms of CO2 saving, a total of 23 billion kilograms. Um, equal to taking um, the equivalent of 48% of the cars in the United Kingdom off the road for one year. You could do the calculation for any country um, in the world in terms of the equivalents uh, just by looking at the number of registered vehicles in each car. Um, I apologise for being self-indulgent in using United Kingdom figures, but they're readily available to me. Um, I have so far presented a whole host of um, positives. Um, and are there any negatives associated with the adoption of the technology? Well, the one that um, tends to come up and be mentioned most in the literature relates to uh, where the herbicide tolerant technology has been widely used. Uh, some farmers in North and South America have in the past been over-reliant on the use of glyphosate for weed control and this has contributed to weed resistance uh, problems for farmers. Um, and they have, over the last 15 to 20 years, been encouraged to by extension advisors um, and farming groups themselves to change their practices, to adapt and alter their weed control systems, to um, use a mix of control systems which use other herbicides with different modes of action, and if necessary, to um, mix them with other forms of weed control, such as mechanical um, and hand weeding. Um, and therefore, the 
costs of controlling weeds in herbicide tolerant crops in 2018 relative to 15 years ago will be higher than they were then but um, you have to place these issues in context because weed resistant problems and increased herbicide use uh, that have occurred in the GM herbicide tolerant crops have been equally applicable in conventional crops. In fact, um, the adoption of glyphosate tolerant crops in the mid 1990s was one way of actually overcoming some of the weed resistance problems that many farmers were facing with other herbicides. So what you've had over the last 15 years is yes, you've had increased use of herbicides on the herbicide tolerant crops relative to the early years of adoption. But similarly, you've had the same pattern of usage of herbicides on conventional crops. So um, you've had that same pattern. Uh, and if when you compare the profile of um, the cost of production and weed control on herbicide tolerant biotech crops in 2018 with those on conventional crops, the technology is still proving to be more profitable than the conventional alternative for most farmers and delivering a better environmental profile. Again, I'll just put this um, before I finish uh, the summary slide up again of the impacts. I won't go through it again because um, I think it's important we get to questions as soon as possible. Um, so in, some concluding comments. In sum, um, the insect resistant technology is essentially delivered farmers higher yields, it's reduced their production risk, reduced their insecticide in, uh, usage, um, and given them higher incomes and a more reliable supply of food product, uh, of food uh, and feed, um, and enabled them to in, adopt more environmentally friendly farming methods. The herbicide tolerant uh, technology has primarily given farmers higher incomes uh, from lower cost of production. It's helped many farmers adopt no-till farming systems, which uh, not only deliver carbon benefits, but reduce soil erosion um, and help retain water um, in the soil. Um, both the technologies have made important contributions to increasing world production levels of the four crops of soybean, corn, canola and cotton. And that must have contributed to reducing the pressure to bring new land into agriculture. And in the last two or three years, we are starting to see newer traits be adopted, such as drought tolerant corn in the United States, and fungal resistant potatoes in the United States, um, and insect, insect resistant brinjal in Bangladesh, and they are all now starting to deliver positive impacts. My last slide, in sum, I'd say that after 23 years of widespread use of the technology, there is now a consistent evidence or body of evidence in peer-reviewed peer literature on the impact of this technology. This information that I presented today adds to that literature. As I said, the papers are soon to be made available on the uh, GM Crops and Food Journal website, although if you want the information immediately, um, it's available in the full report on our website. And I would encourage anyone who is listening in to today's presentation to read these papers and if you feel inclined to delve into the references cited and draw your own conclusions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Graham. Uh, I have a lot of questions here for you. And uh, let's see uh, one by one. So I'm just gonna read the names. Uh, the first question is from uh, 
Amin. Uh, where is that? Okay, hold on a minute. I lost that. Amin Alizade Zagari. Why is the commercialization of GM plants so slow and attractive and unattractive to any investors? Uh, to any investors, what can be done for this? What are the gaps? Why is the commercialization of GM plants so slow and attractive to investors? And what can be done for this? What are the gaps? Well, we could spend a long time debating um, <laughs> adoption levels. Um, I'll try and give um, uh, a reasonably short response. Um, the adoption levels have been high in the countries where the technology has been adopted in the number of crops where it's been used. But one of the main reasons there's been limited adoption uh, is associated with the high cost of bringing the technology to market because of the regulatory requirements that have to be gone through. Now, um, when the technology was first uh, bought in the 1990s, it was new. Um, there was um, concerns that there was a need to have it properly regulated um, and the regulations came in. And in many countries now, there are there is very onerous and complicated regulatory requirements which make bringing the technology very expensive. Um, and this is partly the reason why the technology that is available, um, a lot of it is primarily coming from large companies because they are a limited number of large multinational businesses or governments because they're the only people who can afford to bring the products to the market. Also, in terms of the development of regulation for biotech, in many countries, many developing countries, there is the need um, to have expertise who in people, scientists who can essentially undertake those reviews. And there, 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 is, a sh there is not necessarily enough people available who can do that type of work and or some governments have um, taken ideological views that they don't want to use the technology and effectively are denying their farmers the use of a technology which has demonstrated to have delivered a lot of benefits. Um, how do you overcome these problems? It's very difficult. Um, the availability of um, newer gene editing techniques, um, if they are to be given widespread approval um, in many countries across the world. And there are certainly signs that the first countries to approve gene edited crops, especially in um, North and South America, um, are adopting regulatory um, regimes which are less onerous. So that has the potential to enable more of that type of technology to come to the market because it would essentially be cheaper to bring it to the market. Yeah, thank you very much. Before we continue, can you unshare or stop share, Graham, your slide? Can you stop share it? Thank you. Now we can see you fully. Actually, the questions, uh, the question uh, that was raised and you answered it, actually, there were a lot more questions on that. So I'm not going to read those questions because these are the enablers that you said that can promote uh, GM crop adoption. So let's move on to another question. And this is from Pakistan, Nadia Shaukat. Uh, they, she said that she has, uh, they have been growing a lot of crops, but there are there is no irrigation because underground water is not sufficient. Can we resolve this problem using biotech crops? And which biotech crops are more suitable in this situation? Sorry, I, I, uh, I lost the signal momentarily. Could you repeat the question? Okay, so they have a problem on water. Do you know of any biota crops which can, which can solve uh, problems on water or irrigation crops? 
Um, that is a question probably best directed to people who have more knowledge of um, what technology is available in the pipeline um, and the applicability of it to a country like Pakistan. Um, the only current drought tolerant crop that is that has been commercialized is corn in the United States. Um, if I reverted back to somewhere like Pakistan, I would say that the adoption of GM cotton in Pakistan, the widespread adoption, because it's delivering higher yield, is um, indirectly delivering, indirectly delivering um, benefits in terms of reduced water consumption, because it's delivering higher yielding cotton. So the amount of water being used in Pakistan where irrigation is being used on cotton per tonne of output is being reduced. So mm -hmm. it makes the existing crops are making that contribution, but um, I'm afraid I, I am not the right person to ask about what mm -hmm. crops, drought tolerant crops might be coming to the market in the next 10 years. Uh, maybe I can add that we have a drought tolerant sugarcane already commercialized in Indonesia and we have drought tolerant soybean which will be coming up. So I guess uh, Pakistan can wait and see if uh, when can they be commercialized. Now let's uh, hear from, uh, there's one question from Richard Goodman. Do you see evidence that the EFSA positions and EU easy EC decisions impact African country adoption. This is EFSA positions and EU slash EC decisions impact African country adoption. One hundred percent, yes. Um, okay. The European Union's um, stance on biotech. I mean, I I I think you have to in relation to the European Union, you have to draw two distinctive points. Um, EFSA, which uh, for those of you who don't and who don't know what that acronym means, it's the European Food Safety, Food Safety. Authority, Safety. which um, makes the scientific assessments on GM crops. That body generally comes to exactly the same conclusions as regulatory bodies anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. The problem yeah. why the European Union doesn't approve um, the adoption and use of GM crops, apart from insect resistant maize, which is widely grown in Spain and to less extent Portugal, is nothing to do with the science. It's due to politics um, and EFSA's, recommend, EFSA's approvals are only recommendations and the politicians uh, decide that they don't want to give approvals and that unfortunately sends messages to governments in other parts of the world, especially in Africa, who think, well, if the European Union is approving these products, mm -hmm. is there a problem? Yes. And or some African countries which export important volumes of agricultural produce to the European Union worry that if they approve GM crops, they may have problems getting those crops into European markets if they are using okay. traits that have not yet been approved for importation into the European Union. Because the other problem with the European Union system is that even for importation and use approvals, the European Union can take three, four years to go through an approval process where a country like Brazil will do it in three to six months. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. Now let's move on to uh, one of the very basic question. Uh, it's from Simi Basagan, Pang Tangaraj. How does carbon emission get reduced by GM crops in comparison to non-GM crops? As I um, said in my presentation, there are two main routes. Um, if uh, in a conventional crop, if farmers are applying insecticides or herbicides using a mechanical sprayer and they're using the biotech crops and they're no longer spraying or reducing the amount of spraying, they're reducing less fuel. Less fuel use equals less carbon emissions. 
Uh, herbicide tolerant technology has enabled many farmers to go into no-till practices. You don't till the land, you don't release as much carbon from the soil, and you also use less fuel from the process of ploughing. So those are the two main ways that the technology um, directly or indirectly has contributed to reducing carbon emissions. Thank you very much. Now let's move on to another question. This is from Geert Bejager. For the drop in pesticide use, do you take into account the amount of Bt toxin that is produced in the Bt crops during your study? Do you take into account the amount of Bt toxin produced in Bt crops? Europe, that question is probably more related to, uh, would, would be more relevant for a scientist to answer in relation to um, the, the, the Bt um, within the plant. We're referring to the amount of insecticide used on the crop. And, the, uh, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a scientific expert who can comment on the elements that are contained within and how the technology specifically works. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. It is evident that the gains of biotech crops outweigh any disadvantages. However, are there any biological or chemical effects of this technology to human life? This can answer uh, uh, human safety or food safety uh, although it's not in your talk maybe we can add a little bit uh, more well, on it from, from the context of my presentation all i would say is that i have presented the findings of the economic and environmental impacts um, mm -hmm. they are consistent with the findings of numerous other papers in terms of positive environmental and um, economic impacts. The, where there have been um, negative impacts, it's been associated with the way the technology has been used in terms of the development of some weed resistance and some pest resistance. But these are issues that face all forms of agriculture, whether they are yeah. conventional, organic, whatever forms of agriculture, because fundamentally, uh, food production is man trying to produce food um, and there are pests and weeds which are trying to um, eat or compete with those crops. So man is in a constant battle against weeds and pests regardless of which form of agriculture it takes and um, all forms of agriculture face the same issues. Yes, correct. Uh, this is from uh, Marimar but through will, how does one differentiate the productivity gain due to the traits in comparison to the genetic gain brought forth every year with new varieties due to breeding? So did you consider that in your uh, study, the productivity gain due to new varieties produced through breeding? Yeah, the, that, that, is, that is a very interesting um, question. It, it is a complicated uh, question we could spend a lot of time talking about. Um, and yield gains can broadly break that down into those two elements, the improvements in the germplasm from breeding yes. and the ability to achieve those maximum potential gains that the the, the, um, the germplasm has by minimizing the damage that pests and weeds cause. Now, most the vast majority of GM technology is delivering gains from enabling the underlying potential of yield to be achieved by stopping pests and diseases from reducing the yield. So that's primarily where our values are coming from. Now, some of the GM technology has been specifically delivering 
improvements in the germplasm. For example, the um, herbicide tolerant canola, what's called the Invigor canola, glufosinate yeah. tolerant canola, widely grown in Canada, United States and Australia, that has um, improved germplasm, which directly derives from the use of the GM technology. So there's, there's an element of both in that technology. Now, our analysis of the yield gains, it is impossible to break down what proportion of the overall yield gains are due to um, the way the technology has delivered improvements in the germplasm and where it is delivered improvements in the ability of the crops to achieve what the germplasm potential is. The vast majority of it is associated with um, the improvements in the ability of the um, crop to achieve the yield potential by reducing pest and disease damage. Um, there are very few studies that are currently available that actually try to compare the yield of a biotech crop with um, a conventional crop where the comparison is made exactly with equivalent varieties, exactly the same varieties. And that's the ideal way you do it. And the reason why I raise that is because um, I've just been involved in doing a piece of research in Vietnam of which there is a paper currently undergoing peer review uh, where we actually did a farm survey where we could isolate the impacts specifically between the seed that farmers planted with the biotech traits with exactly the same germplasm without the technology. So we were able to identify specifically the impact of that technology. And um, you'll have to wait for uh, that, that, that paper to come out, but I hope it will be available in the autumn. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask next. Now, this question is from our friend Rishi Tiagi. What are the major reasons, uh, what major reasons you attribute to for not uh, accepted, uh, for not, again, again, what major reasons you attribute for not accepted this GM technology by many countries, in spite of all kinds of benefits, are pro-science groups not able to communicate properly to the general public and policymakers? If so, what should be the strategies to overcome that? So here is a question for science communicators like us and Maha, perhaps. But uh, in your point of view, what are we still lacking uh, so that uh, GM technology can be communicated properly? Well, we could spend hours on this. Um, <laughs> there is no simple answer. I mean, we, okay. we, we have a, we've had a problem over 20 years of oh, wow, misinformation yeah. by, vested by people who have vested interest in alternative forms of technology who have unfortunately um, gained a lot of traction with um, spreading information which is inaccurate. And the, the, the key point mm -hmm. is now, after more than 20 to 25 years of widespread adoption, there is a large consistent body of evidence on the impact of the technology, which has largely been positive. So anyone who wants to continue to argue that the impacts are negative needs to look at the evidence. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. Just the evidence. Okay. Um, this is uh, for uh, from BJ Sairam, okay, Dagubati. Other than BT, are there any other microbial insecticidal toxins promoted widely for the development of GM crops? How about working on development of GM crops out of bacterial toxins of symbionts? Oh, this is a research area, researchable area. Let's move on to another question. Uh, okay. 
Can you, uh, this is from Sharon Boner Lauritsen, can you elaborate on your point that GM can have high yield gains for non-GM crops due to reduced general pest levels? Are there any published studies on there at this area? So can GM crops have yield gains for um, can you elaborate on your point that GM can have high yield gains over yeah, non-GM crops? I know, I know, crops? I know what the question is. Okay, okay you got it. Answer. Okay. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, there have been several papers that have looked at what is sometimes called the halo effect, whereby mm -hmm. you get widespread adoption of GM technology which suppresses a particular pest, which then benefits the farmers who continue to grow non-GM forms of the same crop, um, such as cotton, um, whereby you get widespread use of GM cotton reduces overall levels of bollworm and budworm type uh, pests levels in a region and the conventional farmers uh, then gain the same they, they get yield improvements from that there there are um, I'm not sure if they're in our in the reference list to our report but there are certainly a couple of papers from China related to that but there is one paper that we do draw on in our work which quantifies that halo benefit um, mm -hmm. related to reduced uh, corn boring lepidopterin pest levels associated with corn in the United States by um, Hutchinson and a number of other people. It's, it's cited in our reference list, um, but those are just two examples. And, and similarly, um, there's virus resistant papaya in Hawaii um, that the many in the Hawaiian papaya industry say that without the use of virus resistant papaya, there wouldn't be an uh, there wouldn't be a papaya industry in Hawaii, and the widespread adoption of that technology significantly reduced the presence of the virus, which enabled um, the in fact, the organic and the non-GM papaya growers to carry on because they benefited from the area-wide suppression. Okay, so here, are, here is a question from, um, yeah, from Gabi Romero. Uh, what is the basis of farm income? Is it real incomes or projected from yield? Because grain prices are quite unstable. I'm not sure I understand the question. What is the basis of farm income? Uh, the the, the cal calculation that you got, is it real income? Uh, the ones uh, generated by the farm or projected from yield? Is it the it actual? Is, it, is, it is essentially a calculation of extra farm income. The extra farm income is calculated by for example, taking the extra yield times the price, the prevailing price in that year. So each year's figure is calculated dynamically to reflect the yields in each country's crop and the prices in each year, less the changes in the costs associated with insecticide use or herbicide use, um, as applicable in those crops and or changes in the cost of seed and the differential between the conventional and the biotech seed. That's how okay. our figures are calculated. So they are calculated on the basis of differences and changes, but they're done annually to reflect changes in yields and prices and costs of, of key inputs each year. Okay, I think that's clear. And then uh, we have done some studies on glyphosate. So what is the trend 
in the use of glyphosate versus other herbicide packages since the approval of GM crops? Right. Um, the, the information that um, is available on that is in most detail related to the United States. And I alluded to this earlier in my presentation. Um, it, it, you could have a, a long, complex discussion on this, but fundamentally, um, what you've had over the last 15 years is the amount of herbicide being used on both conventional soybeans, corn, cotton, canola in the United States has gone up relative in 2018 relative to say 2005. So it's gone up in terms of the amount of active ingredient used and the computed EIQ value per hectare. It has gone up on GM crops, but it has gone up at approximately the same, if not slightly higher rate on conventional crops where they are grown. Um, it's further complicated by where you have 90% adoption of a crop in the United States. If you want to say what the conventional alternative is, you have to go to extension advisors to effectively say, if you were growing, no longer growing GM, what would you grow conventionally? And you look at what those equivalent alternatives would be. But fundamentally, the amount of herbicide being used on crops in, on GM crops in 2018 is higher than it was 15 years ago, but so is the equivalent on the conventional crops. Um, and if you to make the comparison, the GM crops were environmentally better in 2015, and they're still environmentally better in 2018. The differential is slightly different, slightly less than it was but um, there is still an advantage. In terms of the insect resistant crops, the GM crops are essentially using much less than the conventional crops because they are replacing insecticides. That doesn't mean that the in conventional crops are still using the same amount of insecticides that they were 15, 20 years ago because there is new chemistry available and the trend would be that the amount of insecticides used by a conventional cotton farm in 2018 is less than they would have used 20 years ago, but they're still using insecticides that the biotech farmers are not using. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. So here is a question on uh, crops being planted after another crop. So this is from Geert Ger de Jager. The fact of the race in second crop of soy after wheat actually shows that the use of herbicide does not interfere at all with the growth of wheat on the same field. This is after the, the soybean would be the wheat. And so does the herbicide interfere or not? And it's, he says that it does not interfere. Is it right or is it correct that the herbicide applied in soy does not affect the wheat which is planted after soy? Well, the soy is planted after the wheat, not the other way around. Oh, but, okay. Um, no, um, the, the, I think the issue that um, is being talked about here is the extent to which you might get um, use of a herbicide and it, the residual amount of herbicide staying in the soil and having a negative effect on the follow-on crop, the crop yeah. that follows. For example, in um, a developing country, you might have rice following corn. So if you use um, herbicides on the corn and they stay in the soil, will they have an adverse impact on the rice? Now with the GM crops, you don't tend to get that issue or a problem because the herbicides you're using with the GM crops are glufosinate or glyphosate and they're not staying in the soil and having a negative impact on the growth of the follow-on crop. You did get that problem when you used some conventional crops that you could use a herbicide on um, one crop and it stay in the soil and have a negative impact 
on a follow on crop. Um, in some northern European countries, for example, a crop that's highly susceptible to um, the impact of a herbicide used on a previous crop is something like sugar beet. But mm. for the residual herbicide staying in the soil from a GM HD crop effect having a negative impact on the following crop. No, it's there's there's no um, examples or that being um, a quantified issue. Okay, those are very good answers. Now, uh, we have a question from our friend Maria Mercedes Roca. And she has been uh, telling about the problem in Latin America. Have you had any experience in studying the situation in Latin America, especially Andean countries? What's happening there? How can they get rid of the, uh, well, how can they increase GM production in the part of uh, Latin America, especially in Bolivia? And uh, the activism there, he, she said, is very high. So. Um, any thoughts on uh, what we can do there? Well, the, uh, the, the only um, thing that I would say and I have consistently said over the last 20 years is use the evidence. Mm -hmm. um, the, the point is, this is more evidence. Every year, there are more pa papers in peer review journals which quantify the impact of the technology. Where people make negative comments about impact or allude to negative impacts, you won't see them in peer reviewed, reputable peer review journals. It's just constantly trying to use the information that is available in reports like this. And mm -hmm. not just our work, there are numerous other authors who have written papers often at specific country level, which quantify the benefits. There are numerous ones looking at the impact of the technology in South America. It's just constantly trying to draw on the impacts and highlighting where the sources come from and pointing out that where people throw information at you or claim or make claims of negative impact is um, asking them for evidence that it's come from reputable peer um, representative yeah. research published in peer review journals. Yes, that's correct. Show the evidence. Uh, here is a question from Tony Fisher. One problem with the herbicide tolerance based on glyphosate is the high energy cost of one kilogram of glyphosate active ingredients. Any chance of reducing that? Is there an energy cost anyway? for one kilogram of glyphosate? Uh, I presume that question relates to the manufacturing cost of glyphosate. Um, mm -hmm. I am not the right type of, I, I, okay. don't, I don't know about the, the costs of producing glyphosate or the manufacture of glyphosate relative to okay. the cost or the energy usage of producing other herbicides. So I'm sorry, I can't, I can't provide an answer to that question. Okay, yeah. Well, there are a lot of questions from India, which relates to the pink bollworm. And uh, well, their question is, are there any possible solutions to that in the very near term, in the very near future? Um, I'm not an expert on what technology is, a, is available uh, or may be available um, that controls the specific pest they're talking about or the extent mm -hmm. to which the existing um, traits control it. All I do know is that um, the technology that's available in India has been widely used, um, delivered higher yields to farmers in India, but they are not using the latest available cotton technology because um, it's not gone, it's not been bought to or gone through the regulatory approval process in India for uh, various reasons associated with politics, largely. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this, uh, I'm just scrolling around with uh, more important questions because most of them are similar to the first ones. Um, 
Wait a minute. So while I'm scrolling, um, do you have any, do we have any questions from YouTube or Facebook coming up? Any? Okay, here is from YouTube from Julian Mora. Many GM traits which have been protected by patents have become available in the public domain as patents expire. How do you think this will impact their adoption or their benefits? This could be beyond your... Well, I mean, that, that, that's an interesting question. I mean, um, mm -hmm. some of the first um, traits like herbicide tolerant soybeans, those um, patents, I think, are now possibly um, off patent. So technically, mm -hmm. anyone could um, bring those products to market. But I'm not sure whether I'm not aware that anybody has yet done this. And mm -hmm. I suspect a problem they will be faced with is the extent to which they have to go through new regulatory approval processes uh, to allow, even though it's they're using old technology, whether it will be classified as new technology from a regulatory approval perspective. And if they are, that will raise substantially the cost of new entrants coming into the market. Um, um, I'm not an expert um, who can answer that sort of legal, that legal question. But um, I think it's largely at the moment a theoretical possibility. Um, it might occur that you may get people bringing, uh, more people bringing some of these traits to the market now they're off patent, um, or they might not. Okay. I think uh, we have exhausted uh, most of the questions and uh, for some, some were already repeat, so I was not reading them anymore. Okay, so let's give uh, Graham a short pause for a while and we'll let you rest a while as you think of the key messages that you will tell us in a bit, in a little bit, in a little while. So let's just first show the webinar poll number two. So poll number two is the impacts of GM crops are consistent and well documented in peer reviewed studies, true, false, or not sure. Please take your votes. Thank you very much. So uh, before we let Graham go, let's listen to some of the key messages or uh, well you can repeat your conclusion again but it would be nice if you can provide some key messages for our audience for our participants well the um the the key messages are um essentially me returning to the summary sheet where i said that um over the period 1996 to 2018 the widespread adoption of GM crop technology has contributed to the world using 776 million less kilograms of pesticide active ingredient, which is equal to an 8.6% reduction. But in terms of the associated environmental impact as measured by the EIQ indicator, it is a larger 19% improvement. Uh, for the farmers who have used the technology, they have gained an extra $225 billion worth of extra income, which is equal mm -hmm. to an average of an extra $98 a hectare for each area, each hectare of biotech crop used. Um, the technology has contributed primarily through higher yields, 824 million tonnes of more food, feed and fibre, which has helped reduce pressure to bring new land into agriculture. And that has got to be beneficial for the global environment. 
from the perspective of the best biodiverse land in the world is, is land that is not in agriculture. Um, so if you reduce the pressure to chop down rainforests and bring in new land into agriculture through extra production on existing areas, it has got to be beneficial for the world's environment. And lastly, the technology is contributing to reducing greenhouse gas emissions more directly through reduced fuel use and increase soil carbon storage. Um, the analysis that we've presented essentially aggregates the impacts, draws on a lot of consistent data from a number of studies conducted around the world. This analysis is consistent with most of this um, data um, and I encourage anyone who has listened to this webinar to look at our report, our summaries, and if necessary, draw on the reports and references that we um, have cited and draw your own conclusions. So um, mm -hmm. thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Graham. So with that, uh, we would like to close the webinar by listening to, uh, wait a minute, we still have, uh, okay, I got it. So we have the closing remarks by our global coordinator, Mahalachmi Arjana. Thank you, Dr. Aldemita. And um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Brooks. For agreeing, for agreeing to launch your very rich and evidence-based data in ISA webinar. In one of the COPMOP meetings under the Convention in Biological Diversity that I attended, this is organized by uh, UN, a country delegate, a party, uh, he said that impact only relates to negative outcome. And this is what we see on the internet as well. People are bombarded with fictional negative impact of biotech or GM crops. Today, Isa and Dr. Brooks came together and we have a long working relationship and I'm glad that together we presented data and knowledge that is evidence-based. Isa believes in transparency and building trust among our stakeholders. And we do this based on facts and science. A lot of time people ask me if I'm a supporter of biotech crops and I tell them that I'm a supporter of science and science has proven that biotech crops are safe and offer social uh, socioeconomic benefits, not just to the farmers, but to everyone, including us. So let us be guided by science. AISA will continue to engage all stakeholders to facilitate adoption of GM crops around the globe. And AISA is convinced that agriculture will be in the core, the crux, where it will provide biomass and feedstock to almost all other industries. Today we see energy and fuel, and we are seeing textile, pharmaceuticals, automotive parts, plastics, paint, and many others. And this is going to be a growing list. We will soon unveil our new scope and direction because we know that we need every tool uh, possible so that we can lead sustainable agriculture. That is going to provide many other, it's going to be a key source of um, feedstock for many other industry. So with that, thank you again to Dr. Brooks the participants and of course my organizing team at ISA. So uh, stay tuned on ISA's webinar series and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Maha. Thank you, uh, Let's now see our webinar call number three. Okay, so it shows us uh, what topic on crop biotech would you like to know more about? Food safety, environmental issues, health issues and concerns, new products, labeling for existence of GM and organic crops and international trade. Thank you very much. Okay, so with that, uh, let me close with the first thanking Graham Brooks for accepting our invitation to be our resource person today. Thank you, thank you very much, Graham. And of course, the press release has been uploaded at the PG Economics a website and of the ISA website. So we are on live in, in our Facebook accounts, social media and YouTube. And we will also have the videos 
uh, a YouTube channel, maybe it's an edited one by tomorrow or the next day. So thank you very much also to the ISA family, Southeast Asia, Africa, and Ameri. And finally, we're inviting you to subscribe to our ISA e-newsletter. Do we have that? Okay. Let's, uh, I'll invite everybody to subscribe to our Cup Biotech Update, Drum Beats, and the Petri Dish. And also, we continue to support our activities. And if you want to donate, please go to our donate donation buttons. So see you next time. We're going to have another webinar in two weeks' time, and we will announce that uh, next week. Thank you so much and see you again. Thank you, Graham. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Okay, bye-bye.